Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Theo Hikmat here. Friends call me Jason Zelda, singer, songwriter, and Bible teacher. Today we're going to be defusing Armageddon. There's been some strange events happening, as some of you may have been aware. And there have been some people out there who have been trying to profit off of these events. They've been trying to scare people because of the events that are going on. They've been telling people things like, you know, the Bible says that these things are going to happen and that these are the signs that were at the end and all kinds of stuff like this. Uh, many years ago, I did a video series called Hidden from Jehovah's Witnesses, which I placed on YouTube for free for anybody to watch. 20 parts to the video series. And back then I had done a little YouTube uh, searches and stuff dealing with some of the issues. And even though I'm done dealing with the, you know, Hidden from Jehovah's Witness series and things like that, YouTube still on occasion recommends videos for me to watch. And on occasion they'll pop up a video by XJWs on various different topics. And sometimes I watch them and sometimes I don't. And it just happened to be that there was videos dealing with various different topics of world events and things like that. And one of the things that tend to pop up often is the issue of Armageddon. Armageddon. Uh, a lot of people who have been members of groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and other doomsday cults, whenever there is something on a global scale that gets people's attention, their automatic reaction is to think that we're at the end of the world. That's the automatic reaction, is to think that we're at the end. Because that's what they're told. How many of you out there have been told that the signs that we're at the end of times is wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and all these things? How many of you have been told that? How many of you have been told that the Bible says that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all these things were going to be the signs that were at the end. How many of you have ever taken the time to pick up a King James Bible to see if that's what it actually says? When you pick up a King James Bible, and read what it actually says. All of a sudden you're not scared anymore about the events that happen. Because when people tell you that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and all these things are the signs of the end, they're leaving out some important parts of what those same verses say. They're only quoting to you what they want you to hear in order to get from you the reaction that they want. And the reaction that they want from you is fear. Now, when you two recommended me one of these videos, I said, OK, I'll I'll watch it. I'll take the bait and I'll bite it. Let's see what the video is about. And in this particular video. A Jehovah's Witness leader comes on and tells the people that the pandemic of 2020 was the sign that we're at the end of the end. Or some variation of that theme. And he says that Jesus said that these would be the signs. And at that point, it made me mad. Did Jesus really say that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and things were going to be the signs were at the end. You see, the reason why it makes me mad is because when they come out and make statements like this, leading people to think that this is going to be the end of the world, and then saying, Jesus said this is going to be, the Bible says these things are going to be the signs. And then what happens? The world doesn't end. So who's made to look like the liar? 
The false teacher just goes on and looks for the next big disaster and says, see, now these are the signs that we're at the end. And all the while, they're trying to make the Bible into a liar because they keep saying the Bible saying these things are going to be the signs. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to show you what the Bible actually says. I am fed up with my Bible being lied about. There have been people who have called me, asking me, is this Armageddon? And I've learned over the years how to deal with this issue. I've learned how to deal with it. And rather than doing it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I decided to make a video where I would deal with everybody all at once. There have been people who've called me up telling me they've had nightmares about Armageddon. Their imagination has cooked up some images of what the end of the world's going to be like and then place them right there in the middle of it. And they wake up scared in a cold sweat, terrified. The doomsday group they were in used Armageddon like a time bomb on their mind. And long after they've left the group, that ticker is still going. And they're just waiting for it to go off. Rather than waiting for it to go off, let's defuse it so you can live your life in peace and stop having the nightmares. In the same video I was watching, another one of the Jehovah Witness leaders comes on laughingly saying, well, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. Did it get worse? Did it get worse? Did Armageddon come? Or did things little by little start getting back to basically normal? And life went on. I want to defuse Armageddon and help some people out there who have been having nightmares, who've been living in fear every day that this doomsday scenario cooked up by the Watchtower or any other doomsday cult has put into their mind. I want to give you the peace that the King James Bible brings you. So since we're using the King James Bible, as always, there's new people watching my videos. I want to help you understand this book. There is lies told about this King James Bible that I want to straighten out very quickly. One of the lies is that you can't understand it. They say it's too old because it uses words like thee and thou and ye. There's a reason why the King James Bible uses thee, thou, and ye. So give me just a couple of minutes to explain what it means. It has nothing whatsoever to do with how they talked back then. That is a lie. You don't want to swallow that lie because that is the lie that is often used to turn people against the King James Bible and to tell you, well, that's how they talked back then. But they say we need a Bible that talks like we talk. And then they want to push one of these so-called modern versions into your hands. And the problem I have with the modern versions are many. They're translated from different manuscripts than the King James. They don't teach the same thing as the King James. They remove verses from the Bible. They change doctrines in the Bible. And they keep changing the modern versions, and they don't tell Christians they're changing them. If somebody had a new international version that came out in the 1970s, and they went to the store today and bought a new international version, and you set them side by side, they don't say the same thing. The only thing that says the same thing is the front cover. Both of them will say new international version. But the verses on the inside, some will match, and a whole bunch won't. My King James Bible has been around for over 400 years. It's still saying the same thing. God's word doesn't change. Okay. So how do you understand that these thousand yeasts? It's real simple. You're only going to run into those words when there's a conversation going on. If the person speaking is only talking to or talking about one person, then a T word is used, thee, thou, thy, or thine. So if you hear thee, thou, thy, or thine, that means only one person's being spoken to, only one person's being spoken about. If more than one person is being spoken to or spoken about, then there would be a Y word, you, your, or ye. 
So if you see you, your, or ye in the King James Bible, that means more than one person is being spoken about. So, when Jesus told Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. When you understand the is singular, talking about one person, while ye is plural, talking about more than one person, you then understand the full context of what Jesus is saying. Marvel not that I said unto thee, that's you in particular, singular. But the next word is ye. Ye means all of you, all mankind must be born again. The these thousand yees brings out that distinction. The modern versions destroy a number of Bible verses because they refuse to use the these thousand yees and they choose to use the generic you instead. And they have the verse saying, do not marvel that I tell you, you must be born again. Writing it that way makes the verse appear that it's revolving only around Nicodemus. But in the King James Bible, the these thousand yees lets you know that the first part of the verse is talking to Nicodemus about Nicodemus. The second part of the verse is talking to Nicodemus about everybody. And the distinction is brought out by the use of the these, thous, and yees. And lastly, the King James Bible is translated in what's called formal equivalence, which means as best they could, the translators tried to make a word-for-word -word translation of the manuscripts. They had more than 5,200 manuscripts, and they did the best they could to make a word-for-word -word English translation. The benefit of that is this. Since it's a word-for-word, -word, you can match words and phrases in the Bible to get the biblical definition of those words and phrases. We might have a definition of those phrases today, but that doesn't mean it's the biblical definition. If you're going to read the Bible, you want the Bible's definition of these words and these phrases. And that's going to come into play most likely in this video here, as we're going to match words with words to help you understand this whole issue and help you defuse Armageddon. So when people call me up and they're scared, and there have been some people who called me up really scared about events going on, and they wonder, how come you're not scared? Why are you not bothered? During the epidemic or pandemic or whatever they called it in 2020, I was considered an essential worker, so I had to be out there in it. Okay? But I wasn't scared. So what I want to do is I want to instill in you the faith that I have so that you're not going to be scared. So when somebody calls me up and they say they're really scared about this whole thing, this is what I tell them. No matter what the event is, whether it's a massive earthquake that strikes, whether it is a terrorism that strikes, whether it's a pandemic that strikes, whether it's some other global event that has everybody's attention, it's got people scared. I wanted to take the time out to help them out by showing them what the word of God actually says. And it never fails every single time I've done this to people. By the time the phone conversation is over, they say, you know what, I feel much better now than I did when I called. It's not me. It's the power of the King James Bible, the Word of God. So when a person calls me up and they're wondering about the end of the world, I ask them a series of questions and then I take them to the King James Bible. So let me show you what I ask them. Question number one, do you believe that we're living in the last days? They would say yes. Question number two, I ask them, why do you believe we're living in the last days? Usually their response is, well, you know, the Bible says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence, and they would mention whatever the world event that's going on. I say, okay. Next question, where in the Bible does it say that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all this are the signs that we're at the end? Usually they would say Matthew chapter 24. Now some of them are informed enough to know that the same story that is told in Matthew chapter 24 is repeated in the book of Mark chapter 13 and in the book of Luke chapter 21. And each one of these books goes deeper into the story. And when you put all three together, you get the full story of what's being said. 
And remember, when you're using the King James, you're getting a word for word. So it makes it even more beneficial. It tried to keep it as plain and simple and direct to the manuscripts as possible. So you could know when it says Jesus said this, it's what he said. The disciples said this, that's what they said, etc. So it really helps you understand. So I asked them next, do you have a King James Bible? If they don't have one, I recommend to them to download as a free one that I use for my, my videos here on YouTube. It's called the King James Pure Bible Search Software. You can do a lot of stuff with it. You can search words in the Bible. You can uh, highlight. You can bookmark. You can make the text bigger or smaller. It even has a built-in dictionary. If you understand what a word means, you just click on the word, and if it has a definition, it'll appear at the bottom of the page. Very beneficial, and it's free. The King James Pure Bible Search Software. Once they have a King James Bible, I have them read the verses to me. Usually I don't read it to them, and here's why. They're already upset when they call. So if I read the verses to them, I have no guarantee that they're paying any attention to me. I have no guarantee whatsoever they're paying any attention to what I'm saying. But if they're reading the verses, then I know they have to be paying attention to what they're reading in order to read it. It's going through their eyes, into their mind, down into their heart. I want them to see what God's word actually says. And when you see what it actually says, all of a sudden, you're not going to be so scared anymore. So let's jump into the word of God and see what does the Bible actually say. We're going to start off in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 1, we'll put it up on the screen so everybody can follow along. And we're just going to read through to the part where people quote when they call me on the phone. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And we'll stop there. Because when people call me, that's as far as they go. So I'm going to stop where they stop, because the parts that they deal with is right here. Now, as I read that, some of you may have picked up on something that the doomsday teachers never mention when they mention wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. There's something they left out, isn't it? So let's go back and take a look. Number one. What did the disciples ask him? And what didn't they ask him? Number two, what did Jesus say? What did he actually say? Let's go back. Verse number three. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be, what's the next two words? The sign. Not the signs. The sign of thy coming. They didn't ask him a bunch of signs. They asked him for the sign. There's a difference. The doomsday teachers will throw in your face signs of the times. 
They didn't ask for signs. Remember, as best they could, they tried to make a word for word. So this is the actual question they asked. The sign, not signs. So why did Jesus give them signs? He tells you. Watch. They said, tell us, verse 3, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. The end is not yet. The end is not yet. When you see these signs, Jesus said three things. Number one, see that you be not troubled. If somebody was to tell you to do something and says, see to it, it gets done. What are they telling you? They're telling you, make up your mind that you're not going to stop until the job is done. So what is Jesus telling his disciples? What is he telling you and I? He's telling us, make up your mind beforehand. When you see wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and all these things, make up your mind beforehand that you will not be troubled by it. Why? Because all these things must yet be. There's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. There's always been famines. There's always been pestilence. There's always been earthquakes. All these things must yet be. But the end is not yet. So why are you scared? He already told you. When you see these things happen, it's not the end of the world. So chill. What are you scared of? Dying? If you're scared to die, you need to get closer to Jesus. To live is Christ, to die is gain if you're a Christian. What you got to lose when you're a Christian? But what he's telling you is, these events, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes and things, when you see these happen, don't be afraid. It's not the end. It's like a comforting father just taking you in and embracing you, saying, don't be afraid. It's okay. I'm telling you beforehand that all these things are going to happen so that when they do happen, you won't be scared. You're not going to think the Lord Jesus abandoned you when you see wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, all this. You won't think that he left you and you won't think it's the end of the world because he already told you when you see these things happen, don't be afraid. All these things must yet be. But the end is not yet. So relax. Let's keep going. Verse 7. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. It's not the end. So why are you scared? Why are you scared? Ain't the end of the world. Life is going to go back to normal eventually. Might be a little different normal, but it'll be a normal. But all these things come to pass. There's a unique term that is used in the King James Bible, and that term is, and it came to pass. Remember that from this day forward. This King James Bible used that term, it came to pass, so many times. 
Think about what it means. It came to pass. It came to you to pass by you. Not for you to dwell in it and hang on to it. No. Let it go past. Let it go past. And when it's past, don't dwell on it. Move on. It'll make your life so much better. Now, I mentioned this very same story is mentioned again in the book of Mark and in the book of Luke. And each time they go a little bit deeper. So let's see what Mark has to say with the very same story. Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, because I want to keep everything in context so nobody can say that I'm taking the Bible out of context. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see if what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter And James and John and Andrew asked him privately. Now remember, in the book of Matthew, he said, the disciples asked him. Now we have Mark giving you the names of which ones asked him the questions. Again, they're going deeper into the story, giving you more information. It's a powerful book here, man. Verse 4. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign... Not the signs. What shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Jesus answer. Verse 5. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Again, he's telling you, it's not the end of the world when you see these things. So don't panic. Let's keep going. Verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, In Matthew, he said famines and pestilence. Here he says famines and troubles. You're now getting a biblical definition of pestilence. It's not just disease and things of that nature. But the biblical definition is also going to include troubles. Things that are going to come along that are going to trouble you. But remember, when they come, it came to pass. So let it pass. It may take a while, but let it pass. When you get to the book of Luke and you see the same story, Luke is a physician and he tends to go a bit deeper into things. So you're going to hear some things in the book of Luke that goes pretty deep. And I want you to take note, those of you who spent a lot of time in a doomsday cult. If you had only read the King James Bible, book of Luke, chapter 21, and believed what it said, you could have been spared years of frustration. Because in Luke, Jesus is going to tell you and warn you about doomsday cults and what their message is going to be and what you are to do about them. If you had only known that the King James Bible warned you. Don't go in there. Don't go into that watchtower. Don't go into that doomsday cult. You will know them because they'll have a message 
And the message that they present is a doomsday message that will contradict what Jesus said. Let's take a look at Luke and see what Dr. Luke has to say. This one here, we don't start at verse 1 because verse 1 is talking about the poor widow that put the last of her money into the work of the Lord. This one will be starting at uh, verse 5, I believe, is where they start talking about uh, the temple. Because all these events were taking place at the temple, and then they go to the Mount of Olives and they ask Jesus the question. So this is why they were at the temple in the first place. They were observing this thing that was going on. Well, okay, fine. We'll start at verse 1, just to keep it in context, just so you can understand. They're at the temple at this time. This is why they're at the temple. Matthew and Mark explains that. When they came out of the temple, they started showing Jesus the buildings of the temple. This is why they were in there. Verse 1 will start, and verse 5 is where the portion that we're dealing with goes. Verse 1 of Luke chapter 21. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts before the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he saith, Of a truth I say unto you, that poor widow has cast in more than they all. For of all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her pecuniary have cast in all the living that she had. Verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned in goodly stones and gifts, he said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. Listen very closely. Those of you who spent years in doomsday cults, listen to what Jesus is about to say. Verse 8, he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. Let me read that again. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Remember I told you each of these books go deeper into what Jesus is saying, so that when you put all three of them together, you get the full story of what he's saying? In Matthew and Mark, he said, Beware lest any man deceive you. In the book of Luke, he tells you what the deception's going to be. They're going to come on the scene claiming that the end draweth near. They're going to come on the scene claiming that the end is near. That Armageddon's right around the corner. They're going to come claiming to be Christ. That word Christ means anointed. They're going to come claiming to be the anointed ones of God. The special chosen ones of God. God's organization. God's channel. God's special people. And their message is going to be the end draweth near. And what did Jesus say? Go ye not after them. Don't follow them. Those are the deceivers. If you only knew that the key to unlock the cults is in the King James Bible, you would have never gone in. The moment they pulled out their Armageddon doomsday story at you and told you that Armageddon was right around the corner, this verse should have snapped in your mind. Wait a minute. They claimed their leaders are the anointed brothers? And they're claiming the end draft near. Jesus said, go not after them. And your life, 
good portions of your life could have been spared and not wasted in a cult. If you only knew that the Bible warned that when people come along telling you the end is near, the end is near, the end is near, Armageddon's right around the corner. Those are the deceivers Jesus warned you about. And he tells you don't go after them. Don't follow after them. Some of you probably never knew that was in the Bible. It's right there. Verse 9. But when you hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Luke just has a way of cutting through all the stuff and getting right to the bottom line. When you shall hear of wars and commotions, the other one said rumors of wars. Now you understand the biblical definition of rumors of wars, which is commotions. Things getting stirred up. When you start getting hearing about things getting stirred up, you don't get stirred up. You stay sober. And you won't be afraid. And when the doomsday preachers come to you saying, Oh, the end draw off near, the end draw off near, Armageddon's right around the corner, you just slam the door in their face and say, No, thank you. My God said, The end is not yet. I'm going to believe my King James Bible and not the doomsday teachers. How many times have they gotten the end of the world wrong by setting dates? If they only knew what the King James Bible said, you wouldn't fall for any of their dates. Let's defuse Armageddon. The word Armageddon only appears one time in the entire Bible. One time. Once. Revelation chapter 16. Now here's the thing that a lot of people mess up. They try to figure out the book of Revelation. Revelation is one of those books that's rather complex. And the way it looks to me, I could be wrong, but the way it looks to me is if you listen to the book of Revelation in audio form, just listen to it through, and then listen to it through again, and then listen to it through again. What I notice is it appeared that John was telling the same story, but he did it twice. He tells it the first time, then he goes back and repeats the story a second time, adding a bit more detail, and then goes to the end of the world, and then what happens after the end. Now, the timeline is what people tend to screw up with Revelation 16. The doomsday teachers will tell you that Armageddon is right around the corner. Like in our day. But wait. The word Armageddon only appears in Revelation 16. It appears in the 16th verse of Revelation 16. But there's a timeline that people are skipping. Don't skip the timeline. And you won't be tripped by their Armageddon doomsday tricks. Now, what is the timeline? Verse 1 and 2 of Revelation 16. Remember, Armageddon doesn't show up till verse 16. What does verse 1 and 2 say? To give you some idea as what time frame that's supposed to happen. Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2. Put it on the screen. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying unto the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. That's verse 1 and 2 of Revelation 16. 
they're already talking about people who had received the mark of the beast, which is a some form of mark that is taken within the body that without it, you can't buy or sell. It's a future technology that hasn't come out as of right now. That hasn't happened yet. It talks about here the image of the beast. The image of the beast hasn't been built yet. Not as of right now, it's not been built. So if we don't have the mark of the beast yet, and you don't have the image of the beast yet, well, Armageddon is way down here in verse 16. This is just verse 1 and 2. You can't get to Armageddon until you get past the mark of the beast. Or at least get to the mark of the beast. And we're not even there. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're trying to put Armageddon before the mark of the beast. They're trying to put Armageddon before the coming of the Antichrist. And on top of that, they misrepresent what Armageddon even is. What does it say about Armageddon? Look at what it says here. Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Period. A place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So we have a Greek New Testament telling you that in Hebrew this place is called Armageddon. Why did it do that? It's doing that to tell you that in Hebrew the place is called Armageddon but in Greek, it'll be called something else. In English, it might be called something else. In French, it might be called something else. In German, it might be called something else. But in Hebrew, it's called Armageddon. But it clearly identifies this as a place, not as an event. The Jehovah's Witness leaders have taken their prerogative because they think that they know better than the Bible, I guess, that they're going to write their own Bible. They take and change the Bible to teach that Armageddon is a global, worldwide event. That ain't what this said. It didn't say it's an event at all. It says it is a place where people are going to be gathered together. A place, not an event. Defuse Armageddon when you understand that Armageddon is a place. It's a particular location. We don't know where it is yet. Not as of right now. We don't know where this place is, but it is a place. It's not the whole world. Now, here's some of the pictures that the Jehovah's Witnesses show of their Armageddon. They got a habit of showing meteorites falling from the sky buildings on fire and all this stuff. Their artists are very creative in the way they're able to draw faces and expressions of people in terrified expressions. They love doing this. Scaring people. But wait. Did the Bible say there's going to be meteorites raining down killing people? No, it says Armageddon is a place. It's a place. But look at what it does say here. Let's read from Revelation 16, 16 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 21, and see if somebody can find meteorites crashing down. Let's just stay biblical with it. And he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial upon the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne saying, it is done. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided in three parts, and the city of the nations fell. And great Babylon came a remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, 
and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Period. Where's your media rights? Where is that? Ain't there. It ain't there. It's frustrating when I look at how the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses have so deceived their members. It, it just saddens me. And it is very clear that the things that are happening here are happening way off into the future. This is not something that's due to happen at any moment or right around the corner. There's still some events that have to take place before the end can come. But that is way off in the future, after the Antichrist has gotten here, which he hasn't gotten here yet. So why are you scared? Because a terrorist event happens, or a pandemic breaks out, or some kind of natural disaster or something. Why are you scared now? It's not the end of the world. And even with these events, it still ain't the end. There's still people left over after this happens. And they're cursing God. Rather than going, Lord, we, we messed up, we're sorry. We repent. No. They flipped the bird at God even after all that. He's trying to get their attention. And they still will not give him glory. To this day, they use the name of Jesus Christ as a curse word. Imagine how many times that name's going to be used as a curse word when hailstones weighing a talent, which is, I understand, about 50 plus pounds. Can you imagine hailstones weighing 50 plus pounds raining down? And God's not wanting to do this out of anger against people. He has given people, just like in the days of Noah, he gave people 120 years to stop doing what they were doing, and they refused to listen, so he judged them. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, he brought in Abraham, he brought in Lot, he had them go in and warn the people, God does not want to have to judge this place, will you guys please repent? And they refused. And they were destroyed. When you go through this Old Testament time and time again, the Lord would give people the chance to repent and they would refuse and he would be patient and they would refuse and he'd be patient and they would refuse and finally his patience runs out I want you to understand folks nearly 2,000 years ago Jesus left this world promising that he's going to come back in the future so for nearly 2,000 years, he's been wanting the human race to come back to him. He's our creator. He's the Lord God who created all things. He loves us. John 3.17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He doesn't want to condemn you. He didn't come here to condemn you. He knows we're sinners, and he wants to forgive us if we just come to him and ask him. But if you don't ask him, you don't get the forgiveness. How simple can it be? He didn't say be religious. He didn't say go door to door to watchtower. He didn't say get on your bicycle with your badge on saying I'm elder so and, and try to recruit people in a group. He never told you to do that. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. People don't even understand. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He's the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Jesus said, you believe in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote of me. When Jesus walked the earth, the only scripture that was around when he walked the earth was the Old Testament. So when he talked about the scripture, he was talking about the Old Testament. And he said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But it is they that testify of me. 
yet ye will not come to me that ye might have life. How many different ways did he try to tell them that he's the God of the Old Testament and they wouldn't believe him? So nearly 2,000 years ago, he left this world promising he's going to come back. And he's been patient with the human race. Patient, patient with us. And just like in the days of Noah, the human race just continues to flip the bird at him. There's only one God that I know of whose name is used every day on TV, internet, radio, in print, everywhere as a curse word. And that's the holy name of Jesus Christ. And patiently, he sits on his throne and he waits and he waits and he waits. He's wanting to forgive you. These things were placed into the Bible to make us aware that this book tells us what happened in the past, this King James Bible. It tells us what happened in the past. It tells us what's going to happen in the future. And it tells us there will be a judgment day that comes. But the Lord Jesus is, the King James uses the term, long-suffering. He suffers long. He's patient with us. So he told us in advance, there will be wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, all kinds of things happening. When you see these things happen, don't be afraid. The end is not yet. So don't worry. I haven't left yet. I'm still here. Don't be afraid. The next time there's some global event that comes down the pipe, don't let it scare you. He already told you these things are going to happen. He already told you. So don't be scared. Don't be afraid. The Armageddon they put in your brain? Get yourself a King James Bible and let it wash that nonsense out so you can live your life in peace and get rid of the nightmares. And the next time, if you do have a nightmare about it, instead of running and cowering in fear, you'll be able to stand in front of it and say, bring it. Because I'm not afraid anymore. I've been a Christian since 1980. Never been in any cult. By the grace of the Lord. Why did I not join any cults? Because I was warned beforehand. I was warned beforehand about the cults. I listened to the warnings. And I never joined. So a lot of groups tried to get me over the years. They didn't get me. I credit this King James Bible for making sure that I stayed on the right path. And as we close out this video, let me give you the verse that I live by. And hopefully you'll live by it too. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. As John explains why he wrote the book of 1 John. He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. What's the name of the Son of God? Jesus Christ. Do you believe on him? Do you believe that he came here not to condemn you, but to forgive you? If you just come to him and ask him. If you're in a religion that makes you feel condemned all the time, makes you feel like you're not good enough all the time, always telling you you got to do more, do more, do more. It's not what my Bible says. My Bible says by grace you're saved. Not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. Not of works. 
lest any man should boast. God doesn't want anybody standing his face saying, you know what, I got here because I'm, I'm just that good. You know, I did this and I did that and I went here and I did that. and I would. He don't want to hear that nonsense. Every single one of us that makes it, we're only going to have one thing to say. We are here because of Jesus. He could have condemned us because we've all sinned. But he chose to show us grace. He didn't make it so hard that the poor man can't get to him. He didn't make it so easy that the rich man can't get to him. He made the way simple. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus said. Whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. Doesn't matter what your sin was. He'll clean it up. So, well, Jason, you, you don't know what I've done, man. I've done, I don't have to know what you've done. Jesus knows what you've done. Now, will you let him forgive it? He'll change you. He'll change you. He'll make you brand new, man. He'll make you brand new, ladies. So why don't you, why don't you give him a try? Ask him to forgive you your sins. And don't be afraid of Armageddon. It's just a place. And we don't even know where that place is. It's not some global event that's going to happen suddenly, as the Watchtower says. That's their lie that they use to keep people scared and keep them in their group. But you don't have to live in that fear anymore. You now know what the Word of God had to say. All these things must yet be. Don't be afraid. Don't be terrified, as the book of Luke says. The end is not yet. So take a deep breath. This too shall pass. Whatever is happening in the world that made you click on this video, it'll pass. Will you let it pass? And not be afraid. Walk with Jesus, the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. And as for me, I'm going to keep walking with him and not being afraid. I put together a music site. For those of you who like good music, I like writing music. I don't really talk about my site often, but I like, might as well let you guys know about it. JasonZelda.com. Feel free to check it out. JasonZelda.com. Good music, clean music. I write all my songs and I write jingles and stuff like that. And hopefully you guys will enjoy it. And uh, as far as videos are concerned, I, I guess I'll be seeing you all down the road. If you all want a little bit more of the Defusing Armageddon series, there's a couple of more issues that I'd like to talk about dealing with uh, Defusing Armageddon, a lot of the false stuff that's taught about it. If you're interested in it, just leave me some comments. And if I get enough comments, maybe I'll do another video about it. If not, I'll just move on with life because my life doesn't revolve around all this, these things. I just feel that on occasion... There are times when you have to stand up and say something. And if I can help ease your mind and ease your heart and make it to where you're not afraid through the word of God, then that's what I want to do. So I'll see you guys down the road. Not everybody. <laughs>